check. Oh, there we go. I'm <laughs> so today we're going to continue that, but it's really advantageous that we're in that passage of Scripture today because today we're also going to finally get to ordain our intern pastor, Chris Brent, uh, into the full, uh, full-time ministry, even though vocationally he was a police officer. So uh, we're blessed by that. So today I really wanted to go over qualities of a faithful minister, the Levites, the priests, and the pastors, part one. Next week, we are going to dissect really who the Levitical priesthood is, according to Exodus. But today, I really wanted to talk about pastors. If you were here last week, we talked about and covered, am I on? Off? Check. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, people online, you didn't hear a word I said. So let's close in a word of prayer. Last week, we covered how God is looking for people to stand with him. Remember that? We're going to read that again in our text this morning. But when Moses put the call out, only the tribe of Levi answered the call. And that's why many of us wear Levi's today in memory. No, that's not true either. Okay, so we need leaders. Men called by God to stand for truth, really true ministers, and we need Levites, if you would, who would go against the cultural norm, and I know some of you do that on social media, and it's amazing how you stand for truth uh, on there, and stand for biblical standards and pastors really to lead the way. The Living Water Journey, when we started this church, God gave me a vision of this boat, this old like sailing ship regal and all of that, and we were going out and saving people that were drowning and then training people that were on the boat. Chuck Smith, remember him? He started the Calvary Chapel movement. He said, once you jump into the boat of Christianity, nothing can take you out of that boat. You are secure, but you can jump out, but when you do, someone's going to throw you a lifeline. And that's what we all need to do is throw lifelines to our children, to our uh, family, and to our friends who have walked away from the Lord. It's an amazing journey what God has put us on, and today is Ordination Sunday. This is a solemn event. Ordination is not taken lightly. In fact, when I was first ordained with the Assemblies of God, you ever hear of that denomination? Uh, the process was like taking the state bar. I mean, the application literally ended up to be about that thick. I think it was like 60 pages. And I had to stand before the district presbytery. Presbytery are just leaders uh, in the church. And there were 12 guys asking me questions for two hours. So, Chris, uh, we'll have you come up, and we're just going to ask you a question. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's God's providence, I really believe, that we're in this passage of Scripture on this day. Not only are we ordaining Chris Brunt, but as he becomes a pastor, he's no longer allowed to serve on the executive board. The way our church is set up is the executive board oversees the finances, and pastors aren't allowed to make decisions in that manner. Does that make sense? And so uh, John Natanowski, who did the uh, announcements this morning, is joining our executive board. So he will become an elder uh, Kevin and Katie are back, so we've got our Sunday school director back. No, <laughs> they're visiting. Uh, they're visiting from Seattle. Welcome back, guys. It's so good to see you guys. So in, what, a year and a half you'll be? Okay, maybe in a year and a half they'll come back and we'll get our Sunday school director back and uh, uh, all that stuff. So today we're blessed to recognize God's call. On men, both John, we're going to actually recognize even our deaconesses, pe women that are involved in ministry in the church and ordain them to be, Chris Brun, a gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God who calls men into that ministry. It, it's not a vocation you choose. You can't say, you know what, I think it would be cool to be a pastor. By the way, you've never been a pastor, and I can tell you, most people last two years, that's the stat, and then they have a nervous breakdown and drop out. <laughs> Truly, ministry is a tough burden that you're taking on yourself. And Kristen, 
man, you're going to have to see a lot of that yourself. So it's going to be a lot of prayer time between you guys and your family to keep going. In our text this morning, why don't you turn there? We're only going to read two or three verses. Exodus chapter 32. You know what? Every day I need these glasses more than the day before. I, I'm just like, what in the world is going on with my eyes? Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know, Paul had a, a thorn in the flesh, and some say it was his eyesight. Because when he hand wrote that one letter, he said, see, with such large letters I'm writing to you. So it's speculative that Paul's thorn in the flesh was poor eyesight. We really don't know. Exodus chapter 32. And we made it down to verse 26 last week. Let's start there. Then Moses in the gate of the camp said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. No one else came to stand for God with Moses except the tribe of Levi. It is at this point that they became the priests for the whole nation. God set them apart to be priests. And we study the Old Testament, by the way, because in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us, we learn about New Testament truths. Do you know that? In fact, it's imperative to study the whole book. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says this. Now, these things happen, speaking of the Old Testament stories, even what happened with the tribe of Levi in our text this morning, as an example, and they were written for what? Our instruction. It is important to study these things. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever was written in earlier times, referring to the entire Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance, what's perseverance again? Cheerful endurance. It's not just enduring. You know, oh, I'm persevering, Pastor. I'm barely making it through, but I'm persevering. No, it's cheerfully enduring. And you can only do that with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures so that we might have hope. Verse 5, now may God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus so that in one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the advantage of church. That's why the Bible says forsake not the gathering together of the church. Today, we're also going to go over our mission and our vision as a church. We're going to look uh, quickly at our organizational chart. But in our text this morning, we read that the Levites said they would follow Moses. Now, remember the picture from last week? The whole nation was dancing, probably naked, that's what the King James says, around the golden calf, out of control. Moses came down took the Ten Commandments that God had written with his own hand and smashed him at the foot of Sinai. And he went and ground up the golden calf and he made the Israelites drink the water with the, the gold dust in it. And he stood up in the midst of that uncontrolled crowd and said, whoever is for the Lord, let him come stand with me. And the whole tribe of Levi took the call. Ministry is a call, not a choice. There's many things we can choose in life, but when God calls you to ministry, it is a divine call. He is the one or, that ordains, not men. Does that make sense? All we do is recognize the call of God in someone's life. The Levites stood for the word of God, and God set them apart to be the spiritual leaders of the entire nation. That's what the church should be to the world today. Do you know that we are all royal priests? We read that several weeks ago, that we are all ministers and that we represent God to a lost and hurting world. Our actions are important. We should shine bright with the love of Christ. We were at the concert in the park a couple of weeks ago, and there's a, a, a new believer, and afterwards we were talking to these new believers Everyone had left, and we were still talking, this, this new believer. And 
he had never heard that Christians should be the most celebrant, joyful people on the planet, even in the midst of trial. That the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, not this pious, false humility that people put on. We talked for quite some time, and, and now he wants to get discipled and mentored and grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? That's what we should all be doing, reflecting the love of Christ to a lost world. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul wrote, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. Truth is thrown to the ground today because churches have not been teaching the simple word of God. They've been teaching platitudes. They've been teaching ideas. They've been teaching how to feel good rather than how to be good. Does that make sense? I believe churches today need leaders that will rise up and teach the word of God where we can truly be the pillar and support of truth. Who equips us to do this? It's the pastors. And that's why the church still needs pastors. They still need men that will lead, men that will nurture, and men that will serve, teaching the full counsel of God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God, moved by God. Men were moved by God when they wrote this. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Second Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word. Not your idea about the word, preach the word. Be ready in season and out. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Jesus appoints, calls, and ordains pastors, not boards, not churches, not denominations, and not men. It is God who calls men into ministry. In fact, God has a ministry for all of us in this room. Ephesians 4.11 says, and he, Jesus, gave, or literally in the Greek, it's ordained, bestowed upon some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Note that Paul Peter, and others throughout the New Testament held all these offices. The fact of the matter is, when you are called to be a shepherd or pastor of God's people, you have to operate in all those areas. What's a prophet? Literally, it's in the Greek, it's someone who, that foretells the Word of God. It's not just predicting future. That's part of it, if God gives you that prediction, but it's declaring the word of God. Do pastors do that? Absolutely. How about being evangelists? Should pastors be doing that? Absolutely. How about uh, apostles being sent by God? Absolutely. So these offices, there can be people that are sent to go do a work. They could be an apostle and not a pastor teacher. Are you with me? But a pastor holds all these offices. So Chris, put on those hats because you're going to have a bunch to wear. <laughs> Ephesians 4.12 says, For the equipping of the saints, that's why Christ appoints pastors and leaders to equip all of you saints for the work of service or literally ministry. You guys are all called into ministry. Isn't that cool? That you are all ministers and should be operating in the call of God that he's placed in your life. The Levites built up the nation of Israel and we, being equipped by pastors, build up the church. Notice that last phrase. Hey, all these offices, what pastors' main job is to do is to equip you to build the church, to build the body of Christ. I believe God is calling all of us at, in this ordination Sunday to step into the call to fulfill the ministry to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ to a lost and hurting world. You know, even you young people in, in the audience out here today, God has a call on your life. There's things that he wants to show you and help you. And if you include him in prayer, he will go before you and bless you like you could ever know. 
Living Waters Ascending Church, we've ordained and sent out over 10 pastors, this little church. We've equipped over 30 pastors overseas that have started churches in Ireland, Kenya, and uh, Kazakhstan. (laughs) Isn't that cool? Our guy in Kazakhstan, though, we lost contact with, so pray for him. Levites literally were the pastors of the nation of Israel. Pastors are the leaders of Christ's church today. Proverbs 21, uh, 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, you ever hear it like this, the people perish? Kind of a bad translation. Literally is the people are unrestrained. When Moses came down off the mountain in our text in Exodus 32, he found the whole nation unrestrained. I want you to picture the most wild rave party you can. You got it? People dancing and going crazy and glowing. That's what Moses came down, and the whole nation was doing that around this golden calf. They were wild and unrestrained. Even though Moses had vision, what? He left the people for 40 days, and the person he left in charge, Aaron, was not a leader. In fact, he tickled the ears of the people rather than trying to please God. Had Aaron been a good leader, this would have never happened. We need good leaders. We want to quickly review our mission and our vision and give you a little insight into living water and what we're all about. Our mission is to equip saints and prepare the bride of Christ, to be a place to equip Christians through the teaching of the Word of God in an uncompromised manner. The result really is mature Christians who know God and are equipped to make Him known. Our mission is to be a place to worship God and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. I really believe and know that this results in experiencing God. You ever experience God in worship? Feel that Holy Spirit around you? And being filled with the Spirit and operating the gifts of the Holy Spirit under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Being a place to love and be loved. There's no other place on this planet that when you walk in these doors, you should feel the love of God and know that you are loved by everybody here. You should experience that love in a deep way. Churches where that love is expressed through other believers, the result is ministry to one another and those in our realm of influence. And number four, a place to prepare the church for the end times and equip Christians to endure to the end. You know, almost everywhere in Bible prophecy, it says, he who endures to the end will be saved. So I believe there is an equipping that takes place so that we are mature. Our vision is to become a biblical church. I really believe that it is our goal, and we have not attained it, that we would be a church completely in line with this book, that we look like a New Testament church a completely biblical church. I see a church that becomes the spotless bride of Christ, ready for his return. I see a church functioning perfectly as the body of Christ in complete unity and power, modeling New Testament Christianity. I see a church declaring boldly the gospel as a light to the world. I see a church uncompromised in doctrine, correcting false teaching wherever it's found, and doing all those things in love. I see a church equipping Christians to defend and proclaim the truths of Scripture powerfully and transformationally. And I see a church ready to endure to the end, the rapture. And lastly, and most importantly, I see a church that loves Jesus, that lives the gospel, that loves the truth and knows the truth and proclaims the truth. Our organizational chart We start with Christ as the head of the church. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. For the husband is the head of wife, Ephesians 5.23, as Christ is also the head of the church. The pastor is the overseer of the church, and must meet certain qualifications. Why don't we re- turn there really quick, and let's see what kind of man Chris Brent needs to be. 
1 Timothy chapter 3. All the T-books are together. Starting at verse 1, it is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires the office of overseer or presbyter, is the idea there, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, living in such a way that no one can point at you and say, aha, you're a sinner. <laughs> they all, we all sin. But living in such a way that you can't be accused of abusing or practicing sin. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snares of the devil. We know that Chris Brunt has demonstrated that he's become that man. Elders. In the church, we have Christ as the head, pastors, and then elders. The Bible talks clearly about elders. They assist the pastor with running the church. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, those in the office of pastor-teacher. Remember, pastors hold all offices, even elder. Peter said this, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. Next we have deacons, and literally in the Greek it means waiters or servants. Those who are being sent by someone in authority to do a specific task. A deacon is not an elder, but pastors and elders are deacons. Why? Because we're servants, <laughs> uh, along with their wives. And that's why in the Bible we have deaconesses, not just deacons. Acts 6, 2 through 8 says, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among yourselves seven men, and these are describing deacons, of good reputation, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word, and the statement found approval with the whole congregation. Deacons also have to be qualified. Turn to 1 Timothy again, chapter 3, starting at verse 8. And let's look at the qualifications for a deacon or deaconess. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested and then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Just to wait tables, all these qualities had to, had to come up. Women likewise must be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. And these women, he's talking about the women deaconesses. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children in their own household. For those who have served well as a deacon obtain for themselves a high standing with great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. All right, so we have Christ, pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses committed to serving to living water. And today we really want to recognize all of you that have done that over the years and pray for you. And so uh, before we do that, uh, it's going to be our privilege to uh, bring John Natanowski uh, into the Board of Regents. Uh, our official corporate name is Coastland University. We do run a Bible college. And Living Water is a doing business under the umbrella of Coastland University. 
And so uh, come on up, John. And Cindy. <laughs> we don't have a certificate for you, but you're a deaconess now. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah, deacon. Um, Chris Brunt, why don't you come up to Robert? We're just going to lay hands on John. Uh, Present him with this certificate that he is now part of the elder board. And so anything wrong that goes happens in the church, I'll give you his cell phone. Just call him. Don't call me anymore. <laughs> no. uh, John, it's a great pleasure uh, that we present this to you. And uh, yeah, Alex, could you take a picture? Thank you. I'm looking for my oil. I put it somewhere. Oh, there it is. Thank you. And we're going to uh, anoint John and pray over him. Why don't you reach your hands up this way? Forehead, okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for John and Cindy and their faithful service to you yes, through the many years and their family. And God, I pray that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would give him wisdom Lord, that he would lead well. God, that you would just uh, help him and Cindy in this great task of uh, leading in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. We also have certificates for our, all our board members. You guys have never gotten one of these. Chris, you won't get one because now you're a pastor. So uh, let's see, Robert. There you go. And give that to Ross. Where's Ross again? I forgot. Up north? Oh, yeah, boys' trip. Yeah, that's right. Doofing around. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to uh, recognize everybody that's been involved in, in, the, in our ministries, except for Kevin and Katie. If I knew you were here, I would have made you certificates. Oh, uh, Jan blesses us with her worship. Um, she is uh, just a mighty woman of God, and we want to appreciate you, Jan. Come on up here. Uh, we'll pray for everyone after they come up. Uh, Kathy uh, and Pat, you guys, uh, your hospitality and, and all of that is so great and wonderful. There you go, Jan. Come on up. You don't have to come up. It's up to you, Pat. Pat. We appreciate you guys. Hospitality and potlucks. and You can lean right up there if you want. Uh, Alex Nantanowski is running our audiovisual. Alex, come on up. Doing a great job. Thank you, Alex. Mike Pennington uh, teaches our men's study on uh, Saturday mornings. Scott Holbert, come on up, Scott. Our uh, youth ministry leader, young adult ministry leader, uh, Mark Chu, our interim worship leader, and uh, doing an awesome job. Uh, we reprinted our ordination certificates for Pastor Chris and myself, and uh, there you go, Pastor Chris, and there's mine, and who are we missing uh, John, come on back up here. We want to get a group shot of um, everybody. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, give him a hand. All right, so our organizational chart is God the Father. You know, right now, God the Father is still in charge of all things. And it's not till later that it, we read in the book of Daniel 
It's right about the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel, right about the abomination of desolation. We read in the book of Daniel that the Father gives Christ all rule and authority, and he becomes king of kings and lord of lords, and he has that for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years in 1 Corinthians, Paul says when he puts his final enemy under his feet, who knows what that is? Death. When he throws that into into the lake of fire, then he gives all rule and authority back to God the Father for eternity. So there's a hierarchy even in the Trinity, even in the Godhead, which is really cool. So then Jesus the Son is the head of our church, then pastors, then associate pastors and elders and deacons and deaconesses, and then all of you who are ministers that are within and without the church. There's the organizational chart. If you want this, I can email it to you. So email me, and I'll email you this PowerPoint where it lists all of that. We don't have time to go through all of that right now. Uh, Elder of the Day program, that's, you see, who does uh, announcements up here and things like that. So am I getting pictures, Cindy? Thank you. <laughs> Coastland University, uh, we have an online program. Uh, That's where we're equipping people all over in Ireland, uh, Zimbabwe, Kazakhstan. We even had some students in China at some point, but they dropped off the map as well. Um, We uh, have an articulation agreement with Liberty University now, which is the biggest Christian Bible college in the world. Uh, It's a Baptist school back east. And so a lot of our units will transfer into Liberty's program, which is really cool. Uh, pastoral ministry, we have pastoral care, we have meetings, uh, and now uh, Pastor Chris Brunt, at, well, he will be a pastor someday, I mean, at the end of the service, <laughs> will join us. Our core values, we're really here to equip the body of Christ. It's not about how big we can grow a church. It's not about any of the things that most people measure success by. We're successful if someone comes to this church and is raised up and called into ministry. And we've seen 10 with Chris Brunn, it'll be 11 people that have come through this church, raised up, called into ministry, and equipped to go out. That's pretty amazing. Submitted to one another and the scriptural direction of what a church should be. A church that stands for biblical truth. Our biblical mandate, and this is for all of us, it's kind of our theme verse for the church as a mandate. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7-11. through 11, The end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love one for another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What we all should be doing as members of Living Water is giving God the first fruits in every area of our life, our time, our talent, our temple, which is our body, our testimony, and our treasure. Gossip is not allowed in this church. Socrates had a triple filter test. You ever hear about this? His friend came up to him and said, hey, I got something I need to tell you about your friend. And he goes, wait, wait, wait. Will it pass the triple filter test? And you've, you've, 